that's it. Take this! Hey! <sighs> oh my god, I can't believe I forgot to finish this episode out. Like, it was more than a week ago that I recorded the first part of this episode with the vault. We have all of this other shit to check out. So all of these, um, all of these demo discs for the PlayStation 2 from the official US PlayStation magazine, the PlayStation Underground discs, had, um, notifications, had a lot of additional content. And these were, here we have the download station, stuff you could download onto your memory card and play some games. Honestly, I never really found these to be that useful. I think maybe once I added the game that they were, that they had the in the download station. So like War Jets, it was like, there was War Jets and there was War Tanks and the War Games, the War something with a Z games. Oh shit, ah, damn it. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Spy Hunter, the uh, racing game, Silent Scope 2. You know, I never played this in the PS2, but I did play it in the arcade, and, you know, it was fun. But it didn't feel like something that would translate too well to a to a console game, because the way it worked was you had a large rifle in the arcade, and you would look through the scope, and the scope had, like, a little monitor inside of it, and you could use, and you would snipe. But uh, you don't really have that in a console game. Alright. Event Center Final Fantasy at Medi Me Me Meteor Run? I don't know. Oh, fuck, it's the movie. <laughs> um. You know, I tried talking myself into liking this movie, but it's not a good movie. <laughs> movie opened, Square EA threw a little party for all the Final Fantasy fans at the PlayStation Store at Metreon, San Francisco. Final Fantasy fanatics lined up around the block as rumors circulated that the creator of the Final Fantasy universe, Hironobu Sakaguchi, might make an appearance. Inside the party was in full swing, complete with raffles, Final Fantasy games. Well, it's not all about the movie. <laughs> Aluminum foil armor. Was this a fan convention? or I wasn't paying attention. I got distracted. BV. Where the winners received Final Fantasy toy sets, action figures, soundtracks, and exclusive Squaresoft t-shirts. <laughs> Every so often, a hush fell over the crowd as they showed a video from Final Fantasy X. We wanted to know what some of Final Fantasy's biggest fans thought about the upcoming movie. Final Fantasy You're not going to say that once you see the movie. Anticipation of Sakaguchi-san's arrival was definitely on the rise. Finally, towards the end of the evening, Sakaguchi-san made an appearance. We managed to okay, we're seeing screen. him sign autographs. <laughs> like why the movie was not based on any of the games. The story and characters in Final Fantasy are different each time. And actually, in the beginning, the movie started with the idea that it didn't have to be yeah, yeah, we get it. or related to it. But as we progressed, the theme progressed into taking the Final Fantasy that I've been working with even deeper. It is very similar to Final Fantasy 7 or 9. The title Final Fantasy just seemed to fit. After a press screening of the movie, someone wrote, This is Final Fantasy. I feel the same way in that there aren't similarities when comparing every detail, but the game and movie share the same feeling. You know, that movie looked, really important to me. Um, I mean, for the most the part, it was, it was a little Final uneven Fantasy in terms of the quality of the 3D art in it. But in some respects, that movie looked absolutely incredible for its time. 
you can enjoy the movie. Even it's in the games, time was 20 years ago, though. So modern CG, although I think is overused in modern movies, is pretty much puts it to shame. Plus the fact that the movie it was uneven in terms of quality. Like there were some scenes, most of the stuff that found their way into the trailers, were they had much higher quality models and animations and the environments were more detailed and everything looked better. Other scenes, they seem like they didn't spend nearly as much time on. And I can get why. I mean, the the quality of animations they were trying to do was very expensive. And you couldn't make the entire movie like that at the time. But, uh, still doesn't change the fact that it happened. The movie's worse for it. I'd like to make one, and I have a bunch of ideas that aren't necessarily sequels. I'm in the process of trying to decide which one to pursue. So yes, I'd like to make the next movie. I hope people will look forward to it. If you can't get enough of Final Fantasy, check the vault for the complete trailer of Final Fantasy X. My headset isn't really working, so I had to... <laughs> uh, whatever. Moving on. Behind the scenes. Ico. You know, I, I played Ico before. I'm going to profess to not really being a fan to any of the things that this studio has produced. I know it's got the diehard fans that love Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and maybe even that... Uh, what was the... What was the most recent one? Last Guardian? I mean, I get that it's got a certain art style and a certain aesthetic, but the... The gameplay, especially of Eco, was never something I was especially fond of. Hmm. Yes. There's some backstory to it, but Eco. Eco doesn't say anything. I don't think he does. And the girl he's with doesn't say anything. The game is, uh, he's never drops that stick. Freaking hacksaw Jim Duggan here. Yorda, that's her name. The art style with her is actually like pretty different than what you for Eco himself. She has a lot less detail on her model, and she's very bright. It's like she almost like she doesn't belong in the world there. I guess that was intentional. I, I didn't play all the way through Eco, so I don't know what her backstory is. Not that there's any dialogue or anything between the characters. They don't speak the same language. I guess there is something to be said about uh, the story of it there, where you have these two characters, and he's working to rescue her, but the two can't communicate at all, or at least not verbally. So there's some like non-verbal connection between them. But I'm I'm not a huge fan of escort quests in general, and what you have is an entire game of Escort quest. <laughs> oh, dropped the sword. Oh, gonna drop him. Ah, oh, down he goes. Tell you what, it did have good animations, though. I mean, the characters were very expressive with their animations. 
they weren't necessarily what I would call realistic. I mean, people don't move the way that Eco or Yorda did. But they're very expressive. You don't necessarily want, especially when you're dealing with character models that are low detail, like what you saw on the PS2, you don't necessarily want realistic animations. You want very over-expressive animations. I remember when Eco released, you had a lot of the game journalists who were ranting and raving about how great it was. But I don't think it sold exceptionally well. And they sort of got like butthurt about it and saying like, oh, you like you everybody wants better, more unique and innovative games. And here comes one that checks all those boxes and you didn't buy it so basically blaming the gamers for not being on board with it i'd say uh, not being a fan of eco or shadow of the colossus really i'd say that's i mean just because it's new or innovative or anything like that doesn't mean it's good Connecticut behind the scenes Racing game, when I was playing the demo, I talked about this, and reminds me a little bit of sort of like a PS2-ish concept of uh, Wipeout. Much more animated in terms of, like, you could do tricks and all that kind of stuff, the kind of things that you couldn't really do in Wipeout, but the racing felt like Wipeout. Done by an American studio. I guess so. Video games. Very um unusual change. Ass shot. Back in the seventies and into the eighties. Game development was really kind of dominated by uh, the Western studios and, and I'd say maybe more specifically American studios and companies and developers. Then there was the video game crash in the United States anywhere. There was a video game crash in the late 70s into the early 80s because you had the, a lot of people blame it on Atari. Atari had the 2600 or the VCS or whatever you want to call it that was very popular but there were were no controls that atari could put in place to prevent garbage games coming out for it so there was a big glutton of games for the 2600 and a lot of them were just god awful and the market for games crashed in the united states anyway it didn't really happen in europe to my understanding and it didn't happen in japan but in the United States, the market collapsed. Then Nintendo comes along in the 80s, in the early 80s, and produces the Nintendo Entertainment System or the Famicom, or whatever the hell you want to call it. For the most part, they're the same machine. And you saw this big shift from Western studios to being done by in Japan. Japan video games were a big deal still and eventually they sort of the filter back in the United States as the video game crash ended but you saw a big change now that now Japan really ruled video game development and that was definitely true in the NES and the SNES and you started to see Western studios sort of come back to prominence new studios really but for the most part the PlayStation 1 era was 
a uh, was the era of, of still the era of Japanese developers but the PS2 the PS2 era that's when you saw PS2 the original Xbox the GameCube well maybe not so much the GameCube but you say like you had Call of Duties coming out the Call of Duty games started in that generation you had Halo on the Xbox started in that generation you had I guess this here is a, done by a Western studio. You start to see more Western studios coming back to prominence. And at least now, now not so much in Japan, which is very, seems to be very much focused on their own homegrown games and all that. In the United States and in Europe, Western studios are really the big deal. You have some, yeah, like the Resident Evil games, which are. Japanese you have um, like the Final Fantasy series is still big it's Japanese you still have a number of these older Japanese um, Japanese studios and IPs and all that stuff they're still big deals in the Western world but it's mostly Western studios with Western style games and all that kind of stuff which dominate the market over here now how the hell did I get on this? Well, okay, talking about how this seems to be developed by a an American studio. Of course, there's nothing really American about this. There's nothing uh, Western about this design. This was absolutely something that you could have seen coming out of a Japanese studio. So you hadn't seen the big like divergence in design methodology or goals or style or anything like that at the time yeah was there, was there ever a sequel to this I wonder I mean it's a Sony first party or maybe a second party, I don't know, um, game. And Sony has a surprising number of first and second party game IPs that were associated with the PlayStation brand, but it doesn't really get the kind of recognition that you see out of, like, Nintendo. Nintendo has this huge list of characters and IPs and all that dating back 40 something years at this point playstation's a little bit closer to 30 not quite 30 years yet but nintendo's got a good decade plus on the playstation so it's got that much more time to have developed these these recognizable ips what the hell are you doing back Jack and Daxter. I didn't play much of Jack and Daxter. I had kind of moved away from the whole uh, platformer game craze. But I would say that if you wanted to play high quality platformer games in that generation, the PS2 is really where you wanted to go. On the, um, on the GameCube, which the GameCube was a later... What the fuck? It's weird. Okay, that's weird. Good, none of these people are actors. Fleshies. <laughs> Anyway, between Jack and Daxter, you had, like, uh, Ratchet and Clank or other uh, big examples. You had uh, Sly Cooper was another one. Even, uh, I mean, there were Crash Bandicoot games that came out in this generation, but they weren't exclusive to the PlayStation. I'd say if you wanted the platformer games, PlayStation 2 was really where you wanted to go.
Platformers on the previous generation, the, the N64, the PlayStation 1, the Saturn, were limited by a few things, not just the technology, but the fact that it was the first generation where 3D platformers were really a thing. So you had a bunch of different ways developers tried doing it. You had the Mario 64, sort of like um, the more freeform, thanks to the fact that it had an analog stick on the console's controller. But also you had like, uh, what was that? Banjo-Kazooie? Conkers. Conquer, all those kinds of games. And the N64 is really the better machine for the platformers. PlayStation, of course, you had like Crash Bandicoot. You had uh, Croc. Uh, I would call um, I would call Tomb Raider a platformer to some degree. But it was the PlayStation architecture and PlayStation controller and all that were not as well suited for the 3D platformers due to the fact that they didn't really have an analog stick in the initial um, in the initial system controller so you couldn't really guarantee that everybody had one a DualShock so well, games had to be designed without them only a few games were designed with the DualShock specifically in mind like Ape Escape but the PlayStation had some good platformers but the N64 had the better ones you Jump forward a generation, PS2, GameCube, Xbox. 3D platformers had been in development for a few years. Plenty of time for developers to sort of learn and construct a, a good model for how platformers should function. So they were much better, not just in appearance-wise and you know, like size of the levels and AI design and all that kind of stuff. Developers just had a better understanding of how to make them and if you're looking at companies like insomniac which did um ratchet and clank or or naughty dog which did um jack and daxter here those are very high quality studios that just needed to have the shackles of the playstation one's controller and technical limitations removed to really produce something of high quality but I still wasn't huge into platformers at the time. So I played them a little bit, but I wasn't that invested in them. Talking over all these people. <laughs> Not that interested in what they have to say. I'm just sort of watching the video and saying whatever the hell I feel like. It's a good-looking game for the PlayStation 1, especially a fairly early PlayStation 1 game. So always, well, at least since the pre uh, Crash Bandicoot days, the original Crash Bandicoot, I've always been really impressed with how good Naughty Dog is with pushing the bounds of the systems that they're working on. I mean, reading about how, um, how Crash Bandicoot works on the original PlayStation, like, they went all out and they did a lot of stuff on the playstation that machine was never really meant to do and little tricks and lookup tables and all these other kinds of things and meg memory segmentation and all that to really give the console like a better ability to push 3d design that it really should have been capable of and of course like being having those issues removed with the PlayStation 2. The PS2 was designed seemingly specifically to avoid the kind of problems developers had with the PlayStation 1. And, and and it wasn't just like, oh, we can finally do what we were intending to do before. They sort of went even beyond that. I'd say, though, sometimes Naughty Dog does focus a little bit too much, especially nowadays. Naughty Dog may focus a little bit too much on technology over some other things, other gameplay things like Last of Us 2. I played through that and technically, I mean, from a tech, purely technological perspective, that game is amazing. I mean, it really pushes the PlayStation 4 beyond anything, maybe the one of the best looking games out there and it was a PlayStation 4 game. And Gameplay-wise, though, it had some improvements over 
the original Last of Us, which itself was just sort of like an altered version of what we had seen in the in the Uncharted games before it. But at this point, I'm sort of a little bit tired of the Last of Us formula, or the Uncharted formula, the action platformer, run and gun, that kind of thing. But, you know, who the hell am I? <laughs> there are other problems with The Last of Us 2 as well. I think there was... If I ever do a playthrough of it, which I doubt I will, maybe I'll go into details about it. But it does kind of uh, violate some storytelling conventions, which I know a lot of people have sort of bought into this whole concept of you need to defy expectations and you do something different, but that doesn't mean what you're creating is good. Uh, subverting expectations, the phrase I've heard too many times over the past few years. Just because you're subverting expectations doesn't mean you're doing something good. I mean, I can, I can write a story where it makes perfect sense for a certain thing to happen and all of a sudden I do something different. Like, okay, so you have... But, um, what was um, the big example everyone's had? Not in games, but in the last few years, um, Game of Thrones. That show started to fall apart in the last few seasons. But I think the most egregious example of them hurting themselves for the sake of subverting expectations was to... Uh, spoiler alert, in case you want to watch this show. But you have a an antagonistic force in the North that's more or less just acting like behind the scenes or not overexposed through a majority of the years that this show has been going on. And the impression you're uh, led, led to believe is that the end of this show will occur when these sort of snow zombies are defeated. But the series doesn't end with the final battle against them. It's a couple of episodes before that. So the entire thing ends up getting wrapped up in one episode. But there's one character in particular named John. Who was supposed to be... He's the one that has been in direct conflict with the the White Walkers or the others or whatever. Whatever you want to call them. They were the others in the book series. I, I read a few of those. The White Walkers... There were, some of the characters in the books actually called them White Walkers, too. So it wasn't completely just made up for the show. Uh, anyway. The only character... The, there was maybe... There was only one character that really made a lot of sense. Made all the sense in the world to have defeat this White Walker army. And that was John. He was the character that had been fighting against them. He was the only one. He made it his mission. And all the other things that were going on. All the politicking and everything that was going on. Was outside of his sphere of responsibility. And what he was doing was he was fighting the White Walkers the entire time. Trying to understand them. Trying to find them. Trying to build an army and fight against them. And everything else he did. Such as the, a fight. A battle that took place outside of his hometown and all that was just him working to realize the goal of fighting the white walkers so it only made sense that he was the character that ended up defeating them in the end having the final duel with the the king of the the evil ones or whatever the the king of the others but they didn't do that instead what they did was have his half sister or not really his half sister i guess but the, his, basically his sister just jump out of nowhere and kill the kill the uh, the king of the of the others and this didn't make any sense and it wasn't fulfilling from a storytelling perspective because until a few episodes before you can't even make any claim that she even were aware that the white walkers existed or were a threat or anything like that she just sort of stumbled into this uh stumbled into this situation rather recently. She wasn't fighting against them. She just sort of was there all of a sudden and and kills him. Now, the, if you would ask the writers, I'm sure that they would say that they were subverting expectations. You expected Jon Snow to do this, and Arya did it instead. 
But these expectations exist for a reason, because not just that they're a, a comfortable concept for players, viewers, readers, whatever, but because it's a it's a thing that's expected. It, it's what made sense, and it didn't make sense for Arya to do it. Just because you subverted expectations by having a different character do it, a different character uh, defeat the others, doesn't mean you did a good thing there. Now, that it ended up happening where there were other characters that would have made sense for Arya to go and and kill in order to get her revenge because she was on like a revenge high the entire series and then a lot of those characters like the queen and all those people Arya didn't get a, to exact her revenge on them and that was an unfulfilling thing from her perspective what she, her entire character arc was going from being a kind of a tomboyish girl to being one that was fueled by revenge and wanting to train and become a fighter so she can kill all the people that have wronged her. And she doesn't really get to do that, at least not against the characters you would like the queen or anybody that you or the hound or anybody you'd really expect her to. She kills a couple of people, but not the people that you're really hoping that she would. I'm really going on not about games here. <laughs> but so Arya kills the king of the others but doesn't kill the people that she should have so even though she did this amazing thing at the end it was not a fulfilling thing for her character Jon Snow was fighting against the others the entire time but he when it comes time for him to go and finish his character arc and fulfill his destiny so to speak he doesn't in fact, he gets trapped somewhere and doesn't take part in that really at all. So, okay, so he wasn't fulfilled. His character arc wasn't really fulfilled. But he does end up killing... Um, he ends up killing the insane queen. Not, not the same one Arya was after, but... He does end up killing the insane queen at the end. But it shouldn't have been part of his character arc to go and do that so like you're you've mixed you've you've mixed up character motivations and character goals and where these characters made sense them to go for the sake of subverting expectations and tying that all back to what naughty dog did with the last of us 2 you had these they introduced another character in The Last of Us 2, and okay, it makes perfect sense that you're going to introduce a new character, and her name was Abby. Unfortunately, when you started the game, Abby... I'm going to spoil the shit out of The Last of Us 2 here. <laughs> Abby wasn't introduced to the players in a very positive way. She does something... In a, she does something which would absolutely alienate the fans of the first game. And I said spoiler alert already. So she beats Joel to death with a golf club. Just brutalizes the shit out of him. Now, okay. She was getting revenge because at some point uh, Joel killed her father. So, okay. So she wants... It makes perfect sense that she would want revenge. But... You got to keep in mind, though, if you're developing a game like this or writing a story like that, that Joel is the character that, even though he's a bad person, he's a character that you've gained an attachment to if you were a fan of the first game. So seeing him brutalized like that. Okay, so the you would have to be an exceptional writer to write a character like Abby to have her, like, in a sense, redeem herself enough in the player, viewer, reader's eyes to be, like, a fan favorite. But the writers were definitely not up to that task. So they introduce Abby, have her beat the shit, beat Joel to death with a golf club, and then Abby more or less just disappears from the story for half the game. 
and then you reintroduce her and then suddenly it's you are seeing the world from abby's perspective and the writers thought that doing this like your expectation is that ellie will go on this revenge quest and she will eventually find abby and either get her revenge or learn to grow past the need for revenge that's what made sense for ellie's storyline but what they were trying to do in this story was to subvert your expectations there and have not Ellie really get her revenge and not really learn anything otherwise, but have you gain a different perspective of Abby and understand where she was coming from. And I definitely do understand where she was coming from, but you didn't do enough to make me truly feel like Abby was... Um, a good enough of a character or justified enough in what she did to justify sort of betraying the character just betraying the player's attachment to Joel so they tried to make her a sympathetic character and failed and honestly there were some other there were like really egregious pacing issues with that story but that's beside the point. That would take too long for me to wander through, especially if I haven't uh, written any of this out and I'm just going off the cuff. And I'm I'm not even talking about this demo disc. I'm talking about friggin' Game of Thrones and The Last of Us 2. Things that wouldn't exist... Well, no, the, the book Game of Thrones... A Game of Thrones was released in, like, the mid-90s. But the show wouldn't exist for more than a, or another decade plus after this demo disc. So what the fuck am I even talking about? Come on. I really need to focus on what I'm doing here. Dynasty Warriors. God. I thought Dynasty Warriors 2 was awesome. The first Dynasty Warriors game I never played, but I think it was like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. But Dynasty Warriors 2 comes out, and I guess the developers looked at it and went like, well, the PlayStation 2, so many possibilities for this. So instead of being a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, Dynasty Warriors 2, and then every other game following it, was this large-scale, large-scale uh, combat game where you were like, it wasn't one against an army, but it sort of felt like that. And I think that was definitely the intention. One against an army. And it was sort of like a more action-oriented version of the game Kessen, which I think was developed by Hoey as well. Which was more of a real-time strategy i think it's been a while since i played kess and i'm not sh quite sure but dynasty warriors was so impressive in its day because it was something like what we had never really seen before where i think dynasty warriors ended up going wrong some people still love this series though but i can't really get behind it that whole army of enemies and all that kind of stuff that was so impressive and so as a baby jesus what was so impressive back in 2000 with dynasty warriors 2 is not so impressive now in fact there are other games that do that same kind of thing to a much better extent than what dynasty warriors did and just they reiterated on that so many times that like i can't get it's i can't get impressed or excited or even want to play a dynasty warriors game anymore and that doesn't it doesn't matter if we're talking about dynasty warriors specifically or like the gundam version of dynasty warriors or the legend of zelda version of dynasty warriors i mean you slap a new coat of paint on it just because it's zelda characters doesn't mean i'm gonna give a shit some people will because like a lot of gamers really like to fillet nintendo for every goddamn thing in the world they ever do you take Dynasty Warriors and you replace uh, Lou, Liu Bei with uh, friggin' Link. Doesn't make it a better game. But fuck, whatever. I'm bitching too much. Metal Gear Solid 2. My god, was this game impressive in its day. Like Dynasty Warriors, how it was impressive. This, um, retrospectively looking back on it, it has a lot of flaws in terms of, like, the story is stupidly complex <laughs> in a way that doesn't really make any sense is overly convoluted trips over itself in a number of ways some of its characters are irritating 
blah, blah, blah. Something I'd have to say, though, is I loved the gameplay of it. All this stuff that you could do with knocking guards out, hiding them in lockers, shooting fire extinguishers, all that kind of shit. The sneaking mechanics, the peeking around corners, the jumping out and shooting, all that kind of stuff is awesome. The problem is the game doesn't give you enough and doesn't present the gameplay to you enough to make a lot of these things even matter. Yeah, I can hide bodies in the lockers, but why would I? I don't need to. I could shoot fire extinguishers, but honestly, it's it never I've never run into a situation where it actually made sense to do that. I've accidentally shot them off before and that was cool, but as a strategy, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't matter. The gameplay was awesome, but there wasn't enough of an incentive and the game wasn't designed with enough gameplay segments to utilize all of that. It was, if you know what you're doing, you can just run through the game so quickly and you're more or less just running from cutscene to cutscene. Great gameplay design for its era, not enough of the gameplay. Same thing happened with um, Metal Gear Solid 3 was better at it, but Metal Gear Solid 4, Metal Gear Solid 4 was actually even better in my opinion because as far as gameplay goes, because the shooting mechanics were so much better, the sneaking mechanics I think were better, but again, the game didn't present enough situ of a situation, enough gameplay segments which utilize them, so it was underutilized, the best aspects of the game were underutilized. SSX. I'm pretty sure this game series came about in the PlayStation 2 generation. And it was coming off the popularity of the sort of um, unconventional sports trends that you had seen uh, become popular in the PlayStation 1 era. Snowboarding, uh, skateboarding, BMX, um, inline skating, all that kind of shit. SSX, though... Uh, while a lot of the games before were seeking some kind of sense of realism, SSX2 took that sense of realism, put it in a blender, blended it, pissed in it, mixed in some cocaine, and then guzzled it. So, <laughs> SSX, um, very, actually, I like SSX more than I liked, like, Cool Borders or things like that because it, wasn't so concerned with representing reality. It was just concerned with making the game more fun. Now, some people like the... Some people will like the a more realistic way, just like some people like more realistic racers as opposed to something like a Burnout or whatever. I like the more arcadey kind of thing, something that's a little more absurd. All right, that's the end of cool moves. And what do we have left? Bulletins. There's not going to be anything here. It's just from the first newest info in Connecticut. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm not going to SCEA.com. For... No, either main menu press R1 square and circle. That's previous issue. <laughs> Threads. Ah, oh, PlayStation merch. PS1 carrying case? What? Uh, okay. PS1, we're talking about the portable version of the PlayStation 1. Portable, I mean small. It wasn't really designed to be carried around with you. Even though there was a tiny screen. I, I remember um, seeing somebody with that. And I thought it was cool, but the it's not a portable game. It's not like a Game Boy or a PSP or a Vita or a DS it's an awkward thing to set up. So it feels weird to have a carrying case for a not portable console. And here, PlayStation 2 carrying case, an absolutely not portable console. <laughs> I guess if you are like on the road a lot and you want to take your PlayStation with you. Sure. Shirts. Shirt. And we're back to this. Uh, bah, 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 hot shots golf three. What is the oh oh? Just what's gonna happen in the next issue? 
and a lot of people go into making these discs. Hey, this is important, right? What the hell is this? Did you have to push that thing around? I thought it moved on its own. Is that a picture of Britney Spears behind him? See, this it was a technology that was, I thought was sort of impressive and cool, but you didn't really see it implemented in any useful way. There was the E3 video like this right here, where you could pan around and look around and all that kind of stuff. And maybe somebody thought when it was being developed that it would be useful for... Maybe um, concert events or maybe sporting events or something like that. But it definitely didn't find itself being used for anything. Something, though, that I thought was kind of cool. Uh, not this specifically. It's not practical. But I've seen um, sporting events that have... I forget what the, the app is called. But there, oh, you know what? There was a Britney Spears game that was released in the PS2. Maybe that's why she's behind him there. It's like a dance game, dance rhythm game. But you have, oh, so you have um, for Oculus, and I tried it in PSVR, PlayStation VR. You had these sort of uh, VR ish sporting events and i'd seen um i think it was a wwe yeah wwe event in vr where they essentially put a three an almost 360 camera in the turnbuckles and from that you had essentially a free look where in the headset you can turn left you can turn right you can look up and down to some extent and it gave you a sort of like an impression that you were there and it even had like a stereoscopic 3d effect to it so it wasn't just a video that you had plastered against your eyes. It's just like uh, Google Earth here. <laughs> the problem is, especially in sporting events in general, there's one thing that you want to be watching. Whoever has the ball, whoever's punching someone, whatever. And especially watching a WWE event, it kind of got screwed up in that I was seeing a lot of things that I clearly was never intended to. Like, I be watching the match and I turn and I look down a little bit and I see a bunch of people crawling around on the mat, pulling extension cords and, and trying to not be seen by the hard cam. Or, um, it's kind of weird because, uh, like, it's right on the turnbuckle and there's a tag team match going on. And you see, like, Alexa Bliss standing right there. And... She's like, it's kind of weird to be standing next to somebody who's that close to you because she's standing right next to the, the turnbuckle. So she is like, she is like 15 inches away. And it's kind of weird to be standing that close to somebody who's completely ignoring you. <laughs> it's goofy. It's, it's unsettling. And especially since the 3D effect gets, maybe get a little bit distorted when somebody gets close to you. So you really, you're supposed to be watching one thing, and you're not supposed to be seeing things that you're not supposed to be seeing. So the ability to look around, it's a nice novelty, like this is a nice novelty, but it's not practical in any way. It's cool to see, it's not cool to do. At least more than once. Maybe they've figured out a way of doing it better. I would definitely like to see that kind of thing employed with, um, say, something like an MMA event, just so I could sort of... It's not like you can position yourself around like the referee to get different perspectives on things, but maybe if they put one on each post of the, of the ring or the cage and you could switch between them, you'd be able to, to maneuver yourself around to get different views. And maybe if they let you zoom in or something like that, that would be awesome. But the way it's been, the way I've seen it so far implemented, it's not really. It's cool novelty, but it doesn't really work out that well. So here we go. That is 
going on for this one for quite a while. Not sure how long this video has been, but this is the second episode of this demo disc, so I talked about a lot of shit had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I feel bad. Sorry.